Michelle Anderson, the founder of Clarinet Mentors, and today I have a fun video for you that's going to reveal five of the most common mistakes that I see clarinetists come into my studio with, and I'll show you how to fix it. Now, most of this is not new information for you. You've probably heard these things before, but what I haven't done is put them into one little package where you can really clearly see how these mistakes might cause you trouble. And more importantly, maybe if you recognize the symptoms, you'll know if you're doing them yourself. So as I'm going through these, I want you to really um, notice yourself, maybe videotape yourself and check to see if you might have any of these common problems. What I'm going to do is play for you just a really short excerpt of a simple Mozart piece. This is a little divertimento was taken from a suite that was written for two clarinets and bassoon. And I'm just gonna play it normally once so you get a chance to hear what it sounds like. Just a fun, short little piece. And that's to illustrate for you uh, the kind of piece that a lot of students would come into my office wanting to play. Here's the most common things that go wrong, and usually they're not just one at a time. Usually it's a combination of things, and when we put them together, it really makes it hard. What I'm going to do when I play these is I'm going to turn sideways, because it's easier for you to see things like my embouchure, my body posture, when I'm turning sideways. So right now, I'm going to play that same thing, and I'm just going to make one mistake. Just one little mistake. What major differences you'll hear. Here we go, mistake number one. And I'll explain it afterwards, see if you can catch it yourself. Wow! Boy, did that ever sound a little bit squawky, a little bit hard on my ears. I don't know how much of that comes through the computer, but here in my studio, that just didn't sound as nice. So did you catch what I changed? I was really trying to make one change. What I changed is the angle of my head to the clarinet. So many people when they play clarinet have this instinct to look down when they play. And most people have no awareness that they're doing it. But this angle to our instrument really affects how our air blows through here. One of the reasons I picked this little excerpt is it has a lot of high C's, just our thumb and register key, which is a really reactable note. Listen to what happens to that C as I change my head. I'll start with it upright, which is the position we would like it to be in. Huge difference, huge difference. I challenge you to look for mistake number one on your own and see what you come up with. Here's the second most common mistake and it really often goes along with number one. This one I actually don't think you're going to be able to see so I'm gonna tell you what it is. I'm changing how I hold my tongue inside of my mouth. So from the exterior, you're not going to see much difference. What we want our tongue to do for best sound on clarinet is to arch high. So if this is the top of my mouth, I want my tongue to sit as close to it as I can, as if I'm saying the letter he. Most of us like our tongue to sit lower, sort of a hey. And if we go really low, ha, it'll really make a difference to our sound. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play this for you four times. The first time, he. The second time, hey, which is where a lot of people sit, like hey, doesn't sound as good. The third time, ha, which will probably sound awful, and you probably don't play like that. And the fourth time I'll go back to he, just so you have the contrast. So let's see what those sound like together. He. Hey. Ha. And back to he. So just how I'm holding my tongue really impacts not only how easy those notes are to play, how in tune they are, but of course what the tone sounds like. So I encourage you to 
look at that. If you find your high notes are flat or a little bit squawky sounding, one way to practice it is just to say the word he while you have your clarinet in your mouth, he, and then try playing that high C and watch a tuner. If you can get it in tune, you're probably close to the right position. Let's take a look at our common bad habit number three of today. Now this is one that people regularly fall into. So even if you've had this as a bad habit and then you've corrected it, you may have it again. I'm gonna do what I did last time. I'm gonna play it first kind of normally and then I'm gonna stop and then I'm gonna make the mistake and play it again. See if you can notice what I change and what you hear in the sound when I do that change. Now this change was something that you should have been able to see, although it was very subtle. And it has to do with how much mouthpiece I put into my mouth. Most of us over time, we tend to slip to less and less mouthpiece in our mouth until we have just a very tiny amount of reed left inside our mouth. One of our goals as clarinetists is to let, get this reed to vibrate as much as it possibly can. When we just have a little bit of reed in our mouth, there's not a lot to vibrate. The more reed we have in our mouth vibrating, usually the bigger, more resonant, nicer sound we get. There is a limit. You reach a point on your mouthpiece, it's an invisible line I just call the squeak point, where I go too far and I squeak. You can just take a high C or, or any note that you're comfortable playing and start with a little bit of mouthpiece, put more and more and more in, and you'll hear the progression in the tone. There's my squeak point. What you want to do is get as close to that point as you can, feeling fully in control. And what I felt like when I was playing it is that the first time the notes flowed out quite comfortably and quite easily. The second time when I had less mouthpiece, they didn't come out so well and it was a bit pinch sounding and I found my tonguing harder also. Again, you've probably heard this before, but now is a good chance for you just to check it off the list. So we've looked at three habits so far. The angle we hold our head at, the angle we hold our tongue at inside of our mouth, and how much mouthpiece we put in our mouth. All of these are pretty easy to fix and they have an instant improvement to your sound when you do fix them. All right, we're gonna go on to the fourth habit that's super common that I hear when people play a piece like this. I'm gonna do it and see if you can pick up what I'm doing wrong. In fact, I'll play it normally once and then I'll add the bad habit and you'll hear the difference. Here we go. Now I'm gonna add bad habit number four. Now other than the fact that I slowed down, which wasn't the bad habit I was trying to demonstrate, there was another one and I actually didn't do it very badly. I could have done it much worse, so I just did it a little bit, because most of you probably vary on how badly you have this bad habit. So did you catch what it is? It actually has to do with my breath. When we tongue, it's human instinct that we like to give our air a separate puff of air. So if I just listened to my air stream when I was tonguing, my air likes to do this. A separate burst of air for each note. Now there are some very certain types of tonguing where we want to do that, but most of the time we don't. What we want is our air to be really solid. So for many of you, when you're doing staccato, if you're doing it with your breath, and you don't have really good control of that breath, you're gonna find that your notes get airy and fuzzy and your high notes squeak and they don't wanna come out. That's why I said I wasn't doing it very badly. If I was doing it a lot more huffing, you might even hear something like this. Something like that, where the notes don't even want to come out. So there's two solutions. One is to watch my video on faster tonguing through the stop tongue method. That's a way of tonguing where it's your tongue that ends a note and your air can just keep going as if you're playing one note. That's a really useful technique to know about. Secondly, if you are doing staccato with your breath, you have to have your air super fast. 
so that the reed is always vibrating well. That takes some time to develop. If you look at the video that I have on activating your blowing muscles, it'll give you some suggestions on how to get your air moving faster. I think the easiest thing that I recommend for most of my students initially is to master the stop tonguing technique. That way your breath keeps going. Very easy for me to tongue those high notes, just letting my air go through. I have one more mistake that I'm going to share with you today, and I'm going to continue this video in part two, because there's some other really common mistakes that I think are worth checking in on. But this one's a funny one that, again, most people do not notice when they're doing. So my hope is that what I can do is just give you a little poke and say, hey, watch for this, notice this, because it's really, really common. And I'll see this, people come into my studio, they have a piece they want to play for me, and they'll play it something like this. Now, what I'm not concerned about is that the person made a mistake or so. Nothing wrong with that. But did you notice I made the exact same mistake three times in a row? So I made the mistake, I heard the mistake, and I kind of switched to the right note, kept going, and then I thought, oh, I better restart it. Did it again, same mistake, made the correction, keep going. And then when the second phrase came along that was a very similar pattern, I made the same mistake again. Now, I've taught hundreds of students for 30 years now, so I have this perspective of kind of hearing the same mistakes over and over again, but I've really tuned into it the last few years and it's really influenced how I teach. I believe that many of the mistakes we make when we're learning a piece, for whatever reason, we made it once the first time and we make that same mistake over and over and over again. And I have a video um, on how to practice that has the lizard on my head called Lizard Brain. You should watch that because it goes into it in a bit more detail and I will get more into this in future videos. But when you make a mistake, of course your instinct is to switch to the right note and then move on. Part of our brain doesn't know the difference between the right note, the wrong note, it knows that you played right note, wrong note, kept going. It kind of creates that as a pattern. Right note, wrong note, keep going. In the same way it would go F sharp, G, keep going. It has no distinction between right or wrong, it just knows what you did, and it gets really good at it. So the next time you play that mistake, it knows the mistake, and you're gonna play that mistake really well, again, and you'll do the correction. And that won't bother lizard brain because it expects the wrong note to be followed by the right note. What you really need to do when you're making that mistake over and over again, stopping is fine, but you need to take that little spot and play it correctly without the mistake five to 10 times. Even when it starts to feel easy, you need to keep repeating it until it's so automatic, you barely have to think about it. And that's when we've programmed the correct pattern into Lizard Brain. This will save you so much time. So I'm just giving you the one minute version of it today. I will expand on it further because I think it's a really important part of our learning, but I want you to notice that in yourself. Here's the language people use when they have a lizard brain mistake. They say, I don't know why I always play that F sharp or that one spot always. So if you say something like that, you've already recognized one of those spots. Most of the time people don't notice it. So notice your mistake, notice where you stop and please don't continue on. Take the time to stop and work that little spot. Maybe it's one measure five to 10 times correctly and then put it back in context, back up a bar or two and maybe play a three or four bar phrase a few times. It might seem a bit tedious, but it will help you learn it so much faster and so much better in the long run. So there we go. That's five little mistakes for you to check in on yourself. The angle of your head, where you're holding your tongue inside of your mouth, do you have enough mouthpiece to produce a beautiful full tone? Are you huffing when you tongue, which is really common? You wanna straighten that out. And finally, just notice how you're practicing. If you're making that same mistake over and over again, take the time to fix it. I would love to hear from you. There's a comments box below if you're looking at this on YouTube or Facebook or wherever it happens to be posted. You can also send me an email. Let me know if any of this helped you out or if there's any common mistakes that I should be addressing. 
If you're not already a member of the Clarinet Mentors community, it's totally free to join. If you sign up for my free newsletter, every two weeks you get a newsletter that has a video just like this, designed to help you play clarinet more easily, and some other fun clarinet recommendations that I have. You can do that at the link written in the description below, or just go to www.learnclarinetnow.com. Thanks for watching today, and I look forward to seeing your comments and to seeing you on my next video.